A. <clears throat> oh, sorry, B has to be zero, sorry. And uh, I would not want to take A equals zero because then, uh, then I don't get, I just get the zero, the zero, zero matrix, or vector, it's not gonna be an eigenvector. I can take A to be anything, it would still make the top equation true. It says zero A plus zero B equals zero. I'm gonna take A equals one. Um, and then the vector would be one, zero, right. Or any multiple of this, two, zero, or three, zero, the, uh, the eigenspace of this vector would be n comma zero, where n is any number. So any constant multiple of this would also do, if we could take a equals one to make it the simplest possible uh, eigenvector. Now on the other side, let's do the second eigenvector, eigenvalue, negative k. Uh, and what is this gonna look like? We're gonna have a minus lambda i times v2 equals the zero vector. And with lambda two being negative k, we're gonna have the matrix negative one minus negative k, that's plus k. So negative one plus k, zero, zero, negative k minus negative k. So that turns out to be zero there as well. Okay, oops, I forgot my, uh, let's call it C and D. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, C, if you multiply this out, negative one plus K times C plus zero D has to equal zero. So it takes C has to be zero. And we can take D to be anything. So D could be one. And we would get the, uh, yeah, so C is zero, D is one, zero. So we get, uh, I don't know, so that's the I vector, the J vector. Isn't there a coincidence that they're on the big floor? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's a coincidence. They are perpendicular to each other, they're dot by zero. It's the I and J vector, the <laughs> unit the, uh, basis vectors of two dimensional vector space. Um, all right. So now, remember this process, we're going to do a few more of these, so we'll sort of cement this process. So our solution, x of t, would be c1 e to the lambda 1 v1 plus c2 e to the lambda 2, oh, there's a t, e to the lambda 2 t times v2. All right, so let's put those in there. We get c1 e to the lambda 1t, that's e to the negative t, v1 was 1, 0, plus c2 e to the lambda 2t, and that's negative kt, and v2, 0, 1. All right. <clears throat> One more step, and I'm going to push these through. For any value of t, this is just a uh, scalar multiple out front. So multiplying that component-wise, we would just get C1 e to the negative t, right? Plus zero, because all that stuff times the zero component there. And uh, the other one would be zero plus, and this would be C2 e to the negative kt times one. So far, that's our solution, right. Um, if we write it in component form, notice, now I'm going to drop the vector format. This would just be x of t. We're calling them x and y. So breaking it into components, my first one is just c1 e to the t, uh, e to the negative t. Okay. The second function, that's in the, in the vector function, y of t is just c2 e to the negative k t. Great. So that would be the um, uh, explicit form for x of t and y of t, right? Okay. You can write it as a vector function and all that. 
<clears throat> but I want to go a little bit further. So notice about y of t. I can write this as c2 e to the negative t to the k, just some fancy use of exponent properties. Is that right? Because those multiply to give me negative kt. Okay? But what do you notice about this? This is very close to our solution for x of t. It's very close, but it's x of t over c1. Right? If you divide that by c1, so here's what we got. <clears throat> All right. So um, if you mul if you raise this this uh, this fraction to the k power, then what we got is c two over c one to the k times x to the k. Okay. And uh, this just is a power. Well, those are just constants. So if I call that b. Now what this is called is that uh, well notice. There is no more parameter t. We've write, written y explicitly as a function of x. So we've eliminated the parameter. Okay. So we've eliminated the parameter. That's y. Um, oh, and I should make a note that. Uh, B is C2 over C1 to the K. All right. Okay, so now I want to look at some cases. <clears throat> if we take K equaling 1, then we get Y equals BX to the first. And what's this, uh, what are curves of this look like, curves of this type? You have to go way back to like Math 60, right? Because this is... One in terms of lines. It's a line, right? It's a line. And the slope is B, depending on depending on whatever that ratio of those constants turns out to be. But these are linear, right? Um, so take a look at uh, figures one and two on the back sheet of this uh, of 6.1. And if we look at this, 0, 0, oh, I should have mentioned before, right off the bat, that 0, 0 is a critical point, is it not? Yeah, if x and y are 0, then we get dx dt, dy dt are both 0. Okay. And we get linear, y equals bx. So look at that point 0, 0. That's what we call a node. Again, we saw a node in the first example. And look at the uh, tangent vectors of all those trajectories. Look at the way they point. Which way are they pointing? They're pointing outward. They're emanating outward from 0, 0. So it's an unstable uh, critical point. <clears throat> and it's called a, a proper node if they're all linear emanating from this, right? So they're all pointing at each other, right? Okay. So that's a proper node. A node includes, you know, a singular point like this where they're all emanating out or emanating inward. So figure two, if the, if the signs are opposite, look at all those trajectories are pointing inward. So that is a proper node, but it is stable, a stable critical point, stable equilibrium. It attracts all those. That's also called a seek. Like water, it's all going right down and flowing down the sink. Okay, and this one? Source. Emanating, everything is emanating out from that, right? So it's unstable, unstable node, also called a source. Stable node, sink. Um, let's look at another case. If we take k on the other hand to be 2, then
then what does the function look like? Y is a function of x. Parabolas. Mm -hmm. Bx squared. So we get parabolas. All right. So which ones look like that? So just in terms of terminology, these are still nodes, figure three and four, it's a node, okay? All the, all the trajectories are either going in towards it or emanating out from it, okay? That's a node. Uh, improper in that they're not linear. They don't have opposite trajectories coming straight at each other. Improper, one thing you'll notice is that um, all the trajectory all the trajectories, any ones that you draw here, are tangent to a particular line. In this case, the line y equals zero. So they're all tangent to a single line. Okay? Um, this is stable because it's coming inward, so it's a, uh, it's a sink. This one, if the signs are reversed in the system, they're all emanating out from that point, but still in parabolic trajectories. Okay, so that's an improper node. I'm not going to be too big on whether it's proper or improper node. Okay, it's a node, <clears throat> but we should we should know if it's uh, based on the uh, based on the uh, phase portrait whether it's uh, stable or unstable. Okay? This one's unstable if it's pointing away from it. All right, let's look at one other one other case. What if k is negative two? We get y equals bx to the negative 2, or b over x squared, don't we? And what are these? What are these? Yeah, it's going to be like, can't be equal to 0. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a hype, or a, it's going to be like this. <laughs> oh, right, 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 yeah. Yeah, the graphs, the trajectories will be hyperbolas. Um, yeah, they will be hyperbolas. Yeah? Um, I had a question about the last one. But, mm -hmm. um, so how do you know whether or not it's a sink or source based on the equation? If it's like, if it'll give you some more lines like figure three and figure four will both give you. That's a good question. Right, right. Same. So I showed you figures three and four, figures one and two. How do we know which one, if it's going, if it's going in or out? It's a source or a sink, right? For, uh, so <clears throat> right, yeah, you can do that. You can take the, well, the derivative of y with respect to x, but look at these look at these values here. Based on the signs of these exponentials, what's going to happen is t goes to infinity. x of t approaches 0, y of t approaches 0. So which one do you think it is based on that? Could we, could we infer from that? Mm -hmm. If x and y are both going towards zero as t goes to infinity, then it's a sink thing. Mm -hmm. The water's swirling around the sink, and it's all going right towards the center. Okay. <clears throat> so that's a good point. So in, in all of our examples, <clears throat> they're actually going to be sinks. Figure two, figure four, in this particular, with this, with these functions, okay, because they're going to zero. <clears throat> All right, so those hyperbolas that we see, yeah, figure six. So if b were negative 2, we would have a, a saddle point. So this is the one that we were talking about yeah, I'm talking about before, a saddle point. If you look at a particular trajectory, like if you're at a point on the x-axis, look at that, it's pointing right in towards 0, 0. Okay? <clears throat> but if you're at a point on the y-axis, it's pointing you away from the origin. So these trajectories go in towards, but then if it's slightly off the x-axis or the y-axis, then it just veers away. So yes, that's called, it's unstable. 
Uh, a saddle point is always unstable because different directions it attracts or repels. Okay. So that is a saddle point. All right, any, any questions? We did a lot of stuff in that last example. We eliminated the parameter T, and sometimes there are tricks to be able to do that. Examples based on the value of k. If k is one, we get linear, but they would be sinks because because both x and y are approaching zero. As, as the t gets larger, they're approaching. Yes. Zero. Yeah. Because it's a negative. Yeah, because you got a negative exponent, negative power up here. Of e. So they're both going to zero. Now, if those happen to be opposite, if they're both positive, then it would be a node, but it would be um, but it would be a source. And if it was one x and y would both be going to infinity. This is just a guess, but if one's positive and one's negative, is that where you get the saddle points? Yeah, interesting. Because look at when we let yeah, when we let k be negative two, put that k in there, negative, negative two. So we'd have e to the 2t. Yeah. Yeah. So y would be going to infinity, whereas x would be approaching 0. And that's what happens with all these. At the x coordinate approaches 0, whereas the y either goes to infinity or negative infinity based on the sign of uh, gotcha. this constant out front. OK? Yeah, so interesting. Same sign or opposite sign is definitely going to have some bearing on the type of uh, critical point. Yeah. In fact, if you if you let k be any negative value, then negative k would be positive, and you'd have opposite signs. Okay. All right, good. Some good observations. All right, let's look at another example. So say uh, we got first one, dx dt equals <clears throat> negative 3x plus 4y, and dy dt, uh, x minus 3y. So again, this is linear. Um, and let's write down the, let's just go right to the coefficient matrix, what would it be? Negative 3, 4, 1, negative 3. Yeah. And this written, this of course then could be, this system would be dx dt dy dt, that would be x prime y prime equals a times x, where we take x to be, you know, the, uh, yeah, just x of t, y of t. Okay. So that's matrix form. So, we're definitely using our um, results from chapter five, the eigenvalue method, okay? So again, let's find the e, uh, eigenvalues. Um, so there's my matrix A, and we're gonna be solving the equation determinant, A minus lambda I equals zero. <clears throat> so imagine minus the lambda on each of these. So it's going to be negative 3 minus lambda times another negative 3 minus lambda minus 4 equals 0. Okay. Um, again, this little trick of I can pull out these negatives. If I factor out a negative from both of them, those two negatives would cancel out. And so this would just look like lambda plus 3 times lambda plus 3 again. So I'm going to have lambda squared plus 6 lambda plus 9 minus 4 equals 0. So uh, lambda squared plus 6 lambda 
plus 5 equals 0 to this factor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Plus 5 plus 1. So we get our uh, eigenvalues. Uh, how about negative 1 and uh, negative 5? Um, so yeah, let's start. Let's start making a note of what kind of eigenvalues we get. Just note that these are well distinct, so they're not repeated values. They're distinct real values. Uh, and they have the same sign. They're both negative. So um, let's find the uh, eigenvectors. So uh, I'd be, we'd be solving this uh, matrix equation A minus lambda I times V equals the zero vector. Okay, so with lambda being negative one, it would be negative three minus negative one, is that right? Or is that right, negative two? One thing I remember about linear algebra is just the arithmetic. Yeah, all these negative signs, but um, so negative three minus that lambda minus negative one is plus one, that gets negative two, negative two. Four, one, and this guy's gotta be the same value, so negative two. And if we get it right, one row should be a constant multiple of the other. That's a quick way to check. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. Multiply uh, row two by negative two, you get yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So what is this going to give us? It's going to give us some equations: negative two a plus four b equals zero, or equivalently a plus negative two b equals zero. So we could say a equals two b. If we take um, B to be 1, then A would be 2. Okay, so we can use um, our, our eigenvector as uh, 2, 1. Okay. All right, let's do the same thing here for the other eigenvalue. What was that one? Negative 5. All right, <clears throat> so negative three minus negative five, that's plus five, that's gonna give me a two. All right, so we're gonna have a positive two, four, one, negative three minus negative five, that's negative three plus five, that gives us a two. And again, the top row is a constant multiple of the second row. Okay. So um, these both yield the same equation because it's a dependent system. So the bottom equation just gives us c plus 2b equals 0, from which we could say that c equals the opposite of 2d. Um, take, taking d to be 1, then we get c equals negative 2. And our uh, vector, eigenvector, would be? Negative 2, 1. Yeah, start with c, negative 2, 1. OK. So we have solved this because these would be two particular, uh, well, we got two solutions, basically. Um, so our solution to this system would be? C1, I'll say e to the lambda 1, that was negative 1, e to the negative 1t times v1, plus c2, e to the lambda 2t times v2, that's negative 2, 1. Okay. Again, and then writing this in component form. Okay. 
our x bar means x, y. So we got two functions in here, x of t, y of t. The top one would be take the scalar quantity, multiply it to the first component, and do term or component-wise addition. I'm going to get 2 c1 e to the negative t minus 2 c2 e to the negative 5 t. And y of t, if you multiply it to the second component, just add those. C1 e to the negative t. C1 e to the negative t plus, plus 1 c2, yeah, plus c2 e to the negative 5 t. Okay, great. Now those look very similar. Um, and another thing we can do is we can look at the ratio, or the slope, y over x. Right, y over x would give me the slope uh, of any point on the uh, phase plane, any slope of the, uh, the trajectory at any point. <clears throat> All right, so y over x would be c1 e to the negative t plus c2 e to the negative 5t over 2c1 e to the negative t minus 2c2 e to the negative 5t. Now, what I want to look at is the slope, and, and why would you think of this beforehand? Well, you might not, okay? But I want to look at this slope, but limit as t goes to infinity. Now, there's a little trick. I mean, both of these go to zero eventually, right? Numerator, they both only involve negative powers of e. So as t goes to infinity, the top goes to zero, the denominator goes to zero. Locutile's rule wouldn't help us because constants would come out of those, but I'd still have e to the negative t and e to the negative 5t, numerator and denominator. So denominator, numerator and denominator would still both approach zero. So Locutile's rule would not be very beneficial, okay? But there is one other thing that we can do. This is a trick from way back. I can um, divide the numerator and denominator by the largest order power or uh, factor in here. E to the negative t, e to the negative five t goes to zero a lot faster. So the largest sort of order of this would be e to the negative t. I could divide by numerator and denominator by e to the negative t, but what I'm gonna do instead, equivalently, is multiply by e to the positive t, numerator and denominator. I want to see where this goes. So I multiply this through that e to the t. What happens when it hits the first term? <laughs> yeah, e to the negative t times e to the t. Those are reciprocals. It's just going to give you 1. E to the 0. So I get c1 plus c2. And what's e to the negative 5t times e to the t? Add powers. Right, e to the negative 4t. And same thing on the bottom. When this hits the first term, e to the negative t times e to the t is just 1. So I'm going to get 2c1 minus 2c2 e to the negative 4t. Okay, so what that does is it, it highlights the ratio. It sort of uncovers the ratio, the rate at which numerator and denominator go to 0. Now look at these terms. These are both going to go to 0. And you're left with that ratio that's untouched, constants. One, one. one over, oh right. So that goes to zero, zero. We get C1 over two C1, otherwise known as one half. Okay, so what does that mean? The ratio of the slope is equivalent, or the, uh, the, the limit of the slope of y over x is a constant one half as t goes to infinity. So, from that, as t goes to infinity, if you set up this uh, uh, proportion, y over x equals 1 half, you get y equals 1 half x. Or y, not equals, but y approaches 1 half x as t goes to infinity. As a ratio, right? So, so that's 1 half. So when I figure 5? Yes. Yeah, that's one half. Yes. So flip over to the back side of that again, and look what's going on there. <clears throat> Figure 
figure five. This is an improper node because it's not a star, a star-shaped node like a, like a C star. They come in, but they're all tangent to this line, y equals 1 half x. All the trajectories eventually are asymptotic to y equals 1 half x. And they're all pointing inward. They're all going towards 0, 0. So that's an improper node because they aren't coming like you know directly straight into each other. It's not linear. It doesn't look like a star. So it's an improper node, and it's stable because why? Right. If you look at these arrows, any trajectory, if you drop a point anywhere, it carries you towards that uh, critical point, zero zero. And again, you can see that from the equation of both x and y. It's sort of a roundabout way, but look at these equations. e to the negative t, e to the negative 5t. So eventually, as, as t goes to infinity, both component functions are approaching 0. Okay, pretty cool. Okay. So yeah, those are both real, and they have the same signs, both negative. Mm -hmm. Both negative, coming inward. Yeah, they're both positive. But distinct. What would you What would you expect would happen? So if you got if you got lambda values of positive one, positive five. Right. So the sign of the values is the stability or instability. Yeah. The relative sign. Yeah. Okay. If they have opposite signs, something weird happens. Yeah. Right. Is there a case where they're unreal? Yes. Are we going to be going mm -hmm. tomorrow? Yes. Tomorrow. 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 